Our environment really sets us up for gravitating towards certain foods. When we become emotional, when we get stressed, when we stress eat, right? We stress eat because food's readily available. It's in our kitchens and we have all this food. So it's not to say you're a bad person. We all do this, but I really wanna lay this out in the context of how it happens, uh, acknowledging it, becoming aware when it does happen. How can we limit this? How can we, you know, kind of apply some of these tips to really help ourselves moving forward so that way we control our food and it doesn't control us. Inside this discussion, we're gonna break down all things emotional eating. Is it okay? Why do we do it? What actually is emotional eating? And all the, all the things, we're gonna talk about every single one of them inside this lesson. And here's kind of how I wanna start out this discussion is that this is something that affects every single one of us. It doesn't make you a bad person if you emotional eat. And it's, it's like I've talked about before, our environment really sets us up for gravitating towards certain foods, towards food in general, when we become emotional, when we get stressed, when we stress eat, right? We stress eat because food's readily available. It's in our kitchens and we have all this food. So we gravitate towards those things. It doesn't make you a bad person. It doesn't make you uh, not have self-control. It's, it's just very hard to have that self-control when it's always present. Even if it is quote unquote healthy food, it's still there and it's the act of emotional eating. So with that being said, what exactly is emotional eating? What is this stress eating, emotional eating? These go hand in hand, but what is it? This is eating in response to emotions rather than true hunger. But true hunger is like more, more or less felt in the, the body. It's felt in the mind. It's felt, you know, you can feel it, hunger pangs in your stomach, but it's more or less felt in your mind. But this is eating in response to emotions. And you, you have a pretty good sense of what this is. Like when you get emotional, if you get into an argument, you're probably more likely to gra gravitate towards foods and certain foods in general, certain types of foods, salty or sweet foods we'll talk about. But that's essentially what emotional and stress eating is. There can also be a craving for comfort foods, and these are typically high calorie, sweet, salty, fatty foods. This can lead to guilt, overeating, and weight gain. There are many factors that contribute to the frequent occurrences of emotional eating. And I said that, you know, we, we gravitate towards these sweet, salty, fatty foods, and that's because our biology, our brain, our biochemistry, just evolutionarily, we know we can get nutrients from fat, from salt, from sweets, from, you know, in nature, sweet meant like berries, sweet meant like you can get nutrients, glucose from it. Uh, fat meant you could get uh, vi fat, fat soluble vitamins, like if you found a fatty fruit or a fatty animal or you found fat in nature, that meant you, you could get energy from that. Now, because of what we've done, we've invented foods that are very calorically dense, but very nutritionally poor. So what we're doing is we're gravitating still, our biochemistry, our, our biology is still hardwired to gravitate towards those things. So we gravitate towards these foods that are very calorically dense, very nutritionally poor, whether that be Oreos, whether that be, um, if you're a salty fan, you know, you can gravitate towards like, uh, Chex Mix or granola or something like that, right? Some, sometimes, you know, these, these foods are marketed as healthy. They're fortified with certain vitamins and minerals, but really it's just cause, like those are the things we gravitate towards. But that's not to say it's bad. It's just become aware of it and notice what I'm going to talk about here. How, how can we address some of these trigger situations? I'm going to address some of the most common trigger situations that tend to cause us to gravitate towards these foods. So that's essentially what emotional eating is. But who is most susceptible to emotional eating? Now, people who are undergoing extreme stress, of course, and don't know how to handle it in a healthy way, these are the people that are most susceptible to emotional eating. And take notice that I said handle it in a healthy way. I wanna ask you, is emotional eating handling stress in a healthy way. Is it healthy? Is it a healthy stress response to gravitate towards comfort foods? Is it healthy? You know, I want to see this from all angles and all perspectives. And I think there's individuals, health professionals that say, yeah, like you can do that. 
And I do think we can, like it's of course, you know, like it depends on the context. It depends on the situation and it depends on how kind of addicted you are to gravitating towards these foods. But just taking a step back, if we do gravitate towards these comfort foods, are we able to say no? Are we controlling it or is it controlling us? Because if we, can, if we are not in control of it and we are just feeling like we can't stop thinking about it and we are stressed so we gravitate towards these foods and we finally give in, I feel like that is leading to very unhealthy, um, a vicious cycle that we don't wanna get into. And I think there's appropriate times to where we can give in to these maybe, you know, emotional eating at times, and, but we don't want it to be the, the rule. This is, we want it to be the exception, okay? So it's not to say you're a bad person because like I said, this is just the environment we're in and it really just makes it difficult for us not to be an emotional eater because we live in a high stressed environment with 24 seven access to any food that we love and can want. Like we've, like I love ice cream, I love pizza, I love uh, hot wings. Like I love all these things that are very prevalent in, in our society today. And I know just by living in this environment, I know I can get that. Like at the click of a button, I can get that in the matter of minutes, which is so far removed from what we truly have evolved with it's just taking a step back and understanding that this is why we emotional eat because we know we can get those things when we're stressed. Who else is most susceptible to this? Those who use food to self-medicate and self-regulate mood are also at risk, as well as those who've experienced a level of trauma in their life, which we're gonna define that shortly. Any one of these individuals, and I feel like we all fall into at least one of these, if not all three of these categories, Food is so emotional, it's so ingrained into who we are. Food is meant to be an experience. Food is meant to be enjoyed. Food is meant to bring us pleasure. That's why we, we experience so much pleasure when we eat food. We, we, we do the happy food dance. We do, I do the sushi dance. Like whenever I have a good piece of sushi, like I go out to sushi and I eat that first piece of sushi, Bethany and I, we always do that little happy sushi dance. I don't know, it's different for everyone, but like bounce around and just mm, 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 make noises and whatever. Like that's the sushi dance. Food is meant to be enjoyed. Food is meant to be just celebrated over and enjoyed with others. And that's, I think, one of the reasons like why we gravitate towards food so much because just somewhere inside of us, we know that food gives us those feelings. And that's truly what we want. We emotional eat because we're stressed, because we are experiencing certain emotions and we know we can kind of mask those emotions, get rid of those emotions through these things that make us feel good. That's why we Netflix and chill or Netflix or just chill, whatever you want to imagine. We, we do these things to get us out of these emotions that we don't want to feel to start experiencing different emotions. And I think subconsciously, maybe consciously for, for those of us who may be a little bit more experienced, we, we realize that. We just choose to ignore it and prioritize the comfort and convenience over actually addressing them and trying to get rid of them in a health promoting way. We prioritize that comfort and convenience of Netflix and chilling over going to the gym because it's uncomfortable. It's inconvenient to put on your running shoes and go to the gym and do the workouts, but it's more convenient and we get a different emotion when we just sit there and binge watch Netflix and eat a pint of ice cream, Ben and Jerry's. Uh, the Tonight Dough is one of my favorites, but that's why we do these things. That's why we gravitate towards food and Netflix and uh, scrolling, right? The dopamine hit we get when we scroll on social media, Instagram, like we have to just keep going to the next reel. We have to keep scrolling TikToks because it's like, I'm gonna find something better. We keep getting a little hit of dopamine every time. And it's, how do you break free of that when you don't even realize you're doing it in the first place? Or how do you break free of it when you don't realize like how much it's impacting you? So how do we break free of this? That's what I'm gonna talk about in these tips that come up inside this lesson. But I do wanna take a step back and ask you, how do you know if you are an emotional eater? How do you know? Here's the thing, 
Food is often used as a coping mechanism for negative or even positive emotions. While eating when physically hungry is healthy, emotional eating is not necessarily healthy. Symptoms of emotional eating include sudden hunger, hunger for a specific food, urgent hunger, paired with an upsetting emotion, do you eat, do you gravitate towards the same or similar foods when you feel an emotion? Do you pair one emotion? You just got into a fight with your spouse, so you've you've ingrained it into your, your, your mind that you need to pair this emotion with this food. Do you always go gravitate towards a certain food after you get into an argument? Other symptoms of emotional eating include, it usually involves automatic or absent-minded eating. You maybe don't notice or stop eating in response to fullness. You keep eating even after you get full. And that's gonna go back to some of these biochemistry lessons, you know, getting your hormones back in alignment trying to figure out your leptin, your ghrelin, satiety, signals, and you, you learned all about that already, but some of that goes back into this, as well as feelings of guilt about eating. Do you often feel guilty after you've eaten a specific food? If you've answered yes to like any of these questions and you're like, wow, like maybe I didn't realize I was that bad of an emotional eater. Maybe I didn't realize like I ate uh, out of emotions that much. And don't beat yourself up if you're just now realizing that for the first time or maybe you're like, yeah, that's me. Don't, don't beat yourself up. We all do this and it's not your fault. It's because we're all placed in this environment, this high stressed environment where food is readily accessible. It's really the hardest thing is just first coming to accept that and be aware of that and then, and then understand like we are not just products of that environment, but we are creators of that environment. As soon as you become aware of that, as soon as you become aware that you're an emotional eater, what's causing it that we're going to talk about, then you can choose to create a different reality for yourself. Okay. So if you answered yes to any of these questions, then that means you emotional eat at some point or another. And listen, I'm not on any pedestal. I still do this at times, but I think the only thing that makes me different when it comes to this is that I, I, I recognize it, I'm aware of it, and I put some of these uh, tips into practice so that way I can get out of that so I don't do that. So what causes it? Now, I wanna talk about a few different causes and I've already touched on this briefly. Because food is so abundant, it is easy to turn to it for other reasons than just true hunger. It's easy to turn to it, especially to avoid emotions, people, and intimacy. What causes emotional eating? We want to do this to distract ourselves from high levels of stress. Stress rules everything. Stress is financial, uh, relationships, work stress, uh, kid stress, uh, all these things. I probably just named most of them. All these things we want to just turn to and feel a different emotion from. And here's the thing. Unlike our Paleolithic ancestors who faced short bursts of stress, and then long periods of relaxation, the average American faces chronic, unrelenting stress, whether real or imagined. When stress hormone levels are high, the body naturally wants to consume food, particularly sugar, carbohydrates, and salt. I just said, the American, the average American faces chronic, unrelenting stress, whether real or imagined. It's been said that we suffer most inside of our heads than in reality. All these what ifs, all these thoughts about anxiousness and depression. Anxiousness and depression always, almost always, 99% of the time, almost always result from thoughts about what has happened in the past or what will happen in the future. And most often, those things that we think are going to happen in the future never even happen. Have you ever just been so worked up over something, you want to go into work, you want to, you, you have to go into work, you have to get something done, you're afraid of what your boss might tell you, you're afraid of having that relationship with someone because you're afraid of what you think they might say. So we stress about this for days, hours, days, weeks, maybe years on end. But when you finally come to have that conversation, it was nothing like you imagined more often than not. Like that reality never comes true. We suffer more in our own imagination than we do in actual reality. So that comes back to just living in the present moment. You know, you hear this all the time, you know, be present, be present with your thoughts. 
And when you catch yourself having these what if moments, understand like that's, you have to directly take control of that. That is something that you have control of is your mind. And that's where all these tips and like the meditations, the breath work, the working out is a great way to uh, handle your emotions and your mind. Now that can even be taken to the excessive extremes where you have people that just work out chronically. Uh, but typically when paired with like under eating, that's when it becomes really vicious, right? And that can lead to eating disorders and a host of issues like that. But, but I also mentioned that when the stress hormones are high, cortisol, like I've talked about before in the previous lessons, when these stress hormones are high chronically throughout the day, or if you get into an argument in the afternoon, you're getting that hit of cortisol when you don't need it, right? Maybe you needed it a little bit in the morning to wake you up and to cause you to move your body to hunt or to, to forage food, what have you. When your stress is chronically elevated, you're, you're chronically are wanting these comfort foods, the foods that you know you can get nutrients from. It's just the problem is you get nutrients, you get calories, but you don't get nutrients from these foods. So now I want to jump into these three trigger situations, these three scenarios in which you're probably more likely to be triggered to emotional eat. Here's trigger situation number one. This is trigger foods, okay? This is trigger foods. Trigger foods set off a chain of out of control eating. These common trigger foods are usually packed with sugar and fat, cakes and cookies, or fat and salt, the combo of some crackers, potato chips, or fries. They tend to be high calorie, appetizing, and tasty for the majority of people. Research shows us how this happens. This is because certain substances and foods activate the areas of the brain that are involved with the body's reward system. This then triggers the overeating. If you are dealing with any type of food addiction, emotional eating, or you just get easily triggered uh, from stress and you gravitate towards food, just take some time this week to go through your kitchen, eliminate the foods that you know are going to be tempting. Just get rid of them, right? You can donate them, you can throw them away, um, you don't need to keep them. And, and here's one of the most important things I wanna note with this first trigger situation. We all know that there are certain foods that we simply just can't bring into our homes because if they are there, we will just eat them. We'll eat them no matter what. And if you have those certain foods that tempt you or turn you into the cookie monster, just eliminate that, temp that temptation by not bringing them into your home. And I've had this discussion before, but people will say, you know, everything in moderation, you can have it all. But realistically, you know, we have those things in our, our environment, the things that were just invented. And if we bring those into our home, if it is not appropriate for you right now to have those things in your home, because you know you're not just gonna eat the serving size, or even then having just the serving size could derail you, could skew your microbiome, could just cause you to start eating anything and everything. It could, like these, that's what a trigger food is. It causes you to just eat more and more and then willpower is not existent because it starts hardwiring our hormones. It starts causing this chain of reactions inside of our biology, our biochemistry. That is not something that willpower can just undo because of the environment we live in. So don't bring those things into your home and understanding that it is not restriction, it's not deprivation to say no to those things simply because it's looking at it in terms of the environment we live in. We need to learn to say no without feeling deprived and restricted. We need to learn to say no without this deprivation mindset because deprivation and restriction is solely just the way we see things because of the environment we live in now. If you can change your perspective, change the way you see the world you live in, then you can say no and understand that it is not deprivation. It is not restriction because deprivation restriction is solely just caused by this environment. You can choose to feel what you want to feel if you become good enough at it. It might feel, it might be difficult, it might feel like restriction at first, but the more you practice that no muscle, the more you practice saying no to something, the better it's going to feel and the better you're going to start to see the world and the situations. You're going to be more evolved. You're going to be more enlightened from many different perspectives. So understanding what your trigger foods are, not bringing them into your home in the first place, and even if they are there, willpower might not be enough to get you through it because of biochemistry.
So that leads me into trigger situation number two, and this is trigger feelings. I just touched on this briefly, but trigger feelings can be either good or bad emotions, positive or negative emotions, but they set off our overeating behaviors. Managing these feelings includes identifying the emotion that precedes the emotional eating occurrence and then developing healthy approaches to deal with that emotion, using healthier behaviors rather than using food as a coping mechanism. Counseling, journeying, and 12-step programs are all good options for dealing with trigger feelings. Let me give you some examples. Like I mentioned before, you get into an argument with your spouse and you feel a certain way. Maybe this happens regularly. Maybe you get into these little annoyances and you just get this little hit of cortisol. You get this little stressor in your life. Maybe your, your, your child, maybe your kids do something repetitively and it stresses you out and you just feel the need that when you feel that emotion, you feel the need to eat that food. You feel the need to gravitate towards uh, the foods that are in your home because they're there. I think maybe a good starting point, if you're at this place, a good starting point is to maybe just start by replacing the food you gravitate towards with healthier options, right? If you tend to gravitate towards um, Oreos or Doritos, replace it with equally as good alternatives for you, but they're just upgraded ingredients. You're still gravitating towards food as an emotional replacement for like stress eating, right? You're trying to subside that emotion with food, which I don't like that. Like I don't think that's healthy long-term because I don't think emotional eating is necessarily healthy long-term, but a good starting point is to just bring in food that is of higher quality ingredients. And if you're still emotional eating, emotional eat with that instead. But at the same time, also understand like, uh, we want to try and get away from that. We want to try and pair these trigger feelings with a healthier alternative, with whether that's journaling, talk therapy, talking with someone. Like the, If you get into an argument with your spouse or your significant other, your partner, your kids, the last person that you want to talk to about that situation in that moment is that person. Right? You're probably still going to butt heads. I think taking time away, having somebody else in your life that can just listen to you that can just be there for you, that can just hear you out, not necessarily give you advice, but just be there to be an outlet for you to vomit all over. <laughs> Sorry if I painted a really weird picture for you, but just someone there that can be there to listen to you. It could be your family. It could be a, your best friend. It could be anyone. Think about that person right now. And if you get into an argument with someone that's closest to you in your life, just go to that person and just be like, listen, I just got into an argument Craig says, I need to come talk to you, just vomit all over you and get my emotions out like that. Odds are you're probably not going to want to emotional eat then You're because you just vomited, uh, figuratively speaking, but you're not going to want to eat as much instead of gravitating towards those foods, instead of sitting down with a pint of Ben and Jerry's, call up your bestie, talk to them. So pair these trigger feelings with healthier alternatives. Go do your workout. Don't excessively do your workouts, but do your workout journal, meditate, go on a walk, walk your dog, pet your dog. That's a great way to relieve emotions, but just shy away from food when you do this, okay? You might first start to become aware, like now that we're having this conversation, you might become aware of when this happens. You might start to get into an argument and you might realize like you're opening up that cabinet door or you might start scrolling on Instagram. You might just go to where that app is Maybe you're someone that doesn't emotionally eat. Maybe you're someone that goes to social media and you just sort of like, you know what, screw you. We just had an argument. I'm going to sit here and just scroll on my phone. We all do that, right? We all do that. But like when you're aware, now that we're having this conversation, you're probably going to, next time you do it, you're going to be like, oh, wow, wait, I just listened to that lesson from Craig. Uh, this is me acknowledging it. This is me becoming aware. It's not always easy in that moment, but it's in that moment that you can make a decision. It's in that moment that you can choose to do something different. It's not easy, but if you can choose to do something else, if you can choose to not get into that cycle, breaking free of that cycle, the four stages of creating a successful habit, we need to go through those four stages. It's first about becoming aware, then it's putting into practice, uh, getting outside of our comfort zones. Then we have to like consciously seek ways to you know, make it a habit. And then before long, that fourth stage it's just habitual. We don't have to think about it. We just do it habitually. 
So breaking free of that, breaking free the, the emotional eating, emotional social media foraging, whatever you want to call it, like it's all the same thing. How can you replace these trigger situations, these trigger feelings? How can you pair those with something of equal or greater value to you, but that's going to be more health promoting? So this third trigger situation, this is your trigger environment. This is your trigger environment altogether. As I've talked about and I'll continue to talk about throughout this program, we live in an abnormal environment. You're probably getting so sick of me saying that. This environment is abnormal. It's beautiful. It's luxurious. I love it. But understanding as far as like my biology, uh, whenever I think of like biology, I think of the cartoon Osmosis Jones. Like I think about like my little cells inside my body looking like Osmosis Jones, the cartoon from when we were kids. If you don't know what I'm talking about, YouTube this Osmosis Jones. It is so cool. Like these little cells are like riding around like cars throughout our out of our body is really kind of cool. So like, that's what I think of. Like when I think of like my, my cells, I think of like, they expect a different environment, but like in comes Cheetos, in comes artificial light, in comes uh, light at night, like all these things like, and they're like, I don't want that. Like turn these lights off. Like, you know, whatever, like that's what I think of. So we need a different environment. Those Osmosis Jones cells in there need a different environment. Here's the thing in regards to emotional eating, so what is an environment? What's a trigger environment like? A trigger environment can be a buffet. Oh, talk about like abnormal environment, like a buffet of food where there's a surplus of any food from all walks of life. Like I love it, but that's weird. A holiday could be a trigger environment. A movie theater, a restaurant, or really any specific situation or place that sets off the emotional eating. This can be tough. Because at first, we must identify which environments are triggering us and then learn to manage ourselves in these situations. Manage ourselves in these situations. You're probably already thinking of a few trigger environments in your own life. What are they for you? You can let me know in the comment section below, but trigger environments could be your own kitchen. They could be um, your, your child's sporting event. Maybe you love to get the Coca-Cola. Maybe you love to get the nachos and cheese every time you go. Maybe, maybe you could bring your own snacks. Maybe you could do things like that. You know, like these are all ways that we can um, navigate through this trigger environment. Quick tip, quick win. One effective strategy is avoidance altogether. For example, those who have issues with overspending through shopping find it a better option to just avoid going into the stores in which they tend to overspend. That sucks, but it's a surefire way not to spend money in that store. Likewise, if the buffet is a trigger for you, if going to Buffett is a trigger for you, do you say Buffett too? I say Buffett. Then going to a healthier restaurant may be a better option altogether. However, we may not always be able to avoid these situations and environments, right? Like our kid's sporting event. You might not be able to avoid the, the, the stand, you know, the hot dog stand. So be sure to have a plan of attack such as uh, deep breathing, calling a friend like we talked about, or a sponsor, taking timeouts, having snacks on hand, or even prayer meditation, whatever um, lines with your beliefs. These are all like tangible tips and takeaways that can help you with this trigger environment. All right, so we're still kind of under this umbrella of the question that I asked earlier, but what causes emotional eating? Those are the three trigger situations, okay? Food, feelings, and environment. We also have trauma past trauma in our lives that causes us to overeat. And this past trauma can be physical abuse, emotional abuse, traumatic events, witnessing harm to oneself or others, or even natural disasters. I have talked about this before, you know, in some other lessons about trauma, but I want to uh, share a personal story with you. I want to get a little bit deep with you because it is trauma that we might not even realize that we've been holding on to our entire lives. We might have been holding on to certain traumas from when we were kids, and it could be the, just that spark that, that started this cascade of emotional eating, and we might not even realize it in my own life. And I've shared this story many times before outside of this program, and I've really come to own this story in my own life but it still gets a little deep and visceral for me. But I wanna share it with you because I know that 
this might be able to to help you with whatever it is that you're battling throughout this program. It might help with more than just emotional eating, but uh, growing up, I've talked about this before, but I was born to parents that were 16, 15, 16 years old. My, my, my mom and dad were just teenagers in like 10th grade when I was born. So predominantly I was raised by my mom's parents, my grandparents, and uh, my entire, up until I was 12, I was raised by them. And my mom and my dad were obviously still in my life, just playing their, their young adult roles and having to grow up pretty fast. But my mom, I love her, um, beautiful human being. She got involved in some pretty bad relationships when she was, when I was a kid. So not only did I see beautiful, a loving, a beautiful relationship between my grandparents, I saw a beautiful relationship with my, my, grand, my grandma and my grandpa that lasted 50 years. Like I saw a beautiful relationship in the way that they treated each other, set a very... A strong precedent for for what love and life and relationship should be like but also on the other side of that same coin I also saw some of my mom's relationships um, they just weren't healthy they weren't healthy I saw a lot of abuse when I was 12 when I was 12 years old my mom's husband at that time she was married for a few years to a guy and we were going on camping trips and my 12 year old year was a rough year. It was probably the worst year of my entire life. I lost four great grandparents. I lost four great grandparents that year alone. I lost a great aunt and a, I think 16 or 18 year old cousin through a pretty traumatic um, mono ruptured spleen incident. So six individuals in my immediate life died that year. But I also won the Little League Championships for the third year in a row. So it wasn't all bad. It was a pretty great year, right? Um, but that was a rough year. That was a rough year because I saw death. I learned my own ways to manage it then. Um, some, some ways I'm still managing life because of those experiences then. And I'm trying to recognize that. I'm trying to be aware of when I maybe avoid certain situations, when I uh, just get numb to certain situations, um, but also that same year, my mom being with uh, her, her husband then at the time, we went on a camping trip together that summer. And in the midst of all this, with uh, a few passings already and baseball and everything, I went on this camping trip with my mom. It was an attempt to become closer to her. It was an attempt to become closer in her life because like I said, I was raised by my grandparents, her parents. And she kind of wanted that relationship with me of like a mother son, you know, because she didn't really raise me. My grandparents raised me. So I went on a camping trip with her, with this guy. And I had known him. I was in their wedding together a few years prior. Went on this camping trip. And one night, the day before we were leaving, um, I'm in the tent and they're out by the fire. I'm in the tent and I'm in my sleeping bag, all huddled up nice and warm, but I have to pee. I'm 12 years old, I have to pee. And I vividly remember just getting out and going to go to like the, out, like the bathroom, you know, with the showers and everything at this campground we were at. And I unzip the tent. And as soon as I unzip the tent and peek out, 10 yards away by the fire, I just look up in the glow of the fire, I just see those two standing there very vividly and he hits her as hard as he can. She falls down. That's a trauma to me. And I'm 12. I didn't know what to do. In my, in my mind, I'm like, like, I knew that was not good. I knew that was wrong, but I didn't know what to do about it. And so in that instance, because of the biochemistry we've talked about, you can either fight or flee. In that moment, I chose to flee. I chose to flee. I chose not to fight. Who knows what would happen if I did choose to go fight him. But I got back in my tent, zipped it up, got back in my sleeping bag. And it was like in that moment, it all is kind of a blur at this point in my memory. But I do remember waking up the next morning, early the next morning, and of course, like my sleeping bag is soaked because I had to pee and I, you know, um, by the time I woke up, he was gone. My mom, 
side of her face was bruised, eye swollen shut. And I don't remember exactly how we talked about it, but I remember we did leave that day. And shortly after, I moved in from my grandparents' house to my dad's house. And because it was um, more stable of a, a living situation there. And that was imprinted on me. Like, that's a very vulnerable age. 12 years old, preteen. That's a very vulnerable age. So I dealt with a lot that year. But that was a trauma that I had to deal with that I just kind of pushed down for years that I never talked about to anyone. I also, you know, went through a lot of, I guess, stages in my life. There's a lot of genres of Craig that I went through throughout my teenage years, as I think we all do. I wish I could delete some photos from like 12 to 16 because those were really awkward stages of my life. But um, that's what I went through. And no doubt, I definitely did some emotional eating. I, I definitely did a lot of unhealthy habits because of moments like that in my life. And when I've done this inner work, when I've sat down with myself to, 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 to bring these emotions back up that I've pushed down for so long, when I've sat down with myself or I've talked to others and I've really just let this out, I've realized that some of the, the unhealthy lifestyle factors that I have now, some of the things that I go through now, stem from that moment, stem from those moments in my life, my 12 year old year. Um, some maybe even go back even deeper, uh, further back in my life, but um, that's a trauma in my own life. And yours might be more dramatic, it might be less dramatic, it might not even seem like that dramatic at all, but it was dramatic to you. And what matters is how you express it. And are you expressing those traumas through emotional eating? Are you expressing those traumas through taking that pain out on other people? Are you expressing those traumas through avoidance, through not getting in relationships because of some of these past relationships? Like I said, this lesson, we could branch off into a hundred different directions and have so many conversations about this. But this lesson in emotional eating and stress eating, if you haven't been able to realize, it's so much deeper than that. It goes so much more than that. And what I want to get across is simply this. Emotional eating is usually never the cause, like, like the, the argument that you got in that day that caused you to stress eat. You might become aware of that and you're like, I got into this argument, that's why I'm stress eating. Maybe, maybe that's true, but often it's because of how you've learned to handle other stressors in the past, which is why you gravitate towards those foods. At some point in your life, one moment sparked that stress eating. One moment, one argument, one trauma, one incident sparked that stress eating. Because in that moment where you have that argument or that, that stressful moment of finances and you want to gravitate towards foods, that wasn't the first time. That's just the way you've learned to handle that emotion based off of every other time you've done it before in the past. So it's like it stemmed from somewhere. And figuring out where that stemmed from you is, is one of the most liberating things that we can come to do inside this program. I implore you to do that inner work. That's what I've had to do to be standing here today to give you these tips, to share my story without really getting that emotional. I've recorded this several other times, this story several other times for this reason. And I've had to do it again because I couldn't hold back my emotions and I couldn't get the point across. So understand that trauma can be a reason for emotional eating, okay? Moving on to the next few here, I'm going to go through most of these rather quickly, but some other common causes for emotional and stress eating. Rules. Having too strict of rules at home that may include what to eat, what not to eat, and when to eat can take away the ability to eat in an intuitive way as children learn to ignore their body's signals of hunger or fullness. Now, this is um, a tricky one in our, in our environment with our situations here because we don't want to have too many rules like, you know, I'm running the Ultimate Wellness Academy saying these foods are not health promoting, um, Coca-Cola, Oreos, whatever. Like, you know, I'm not saying you can never have those, right? But like I am saying like if we have certain goals, we want to avoid certain things to be able to achieve those goals. 
So it can seem almost black and white, like avoid these, just eat these foods. But it's, that's having rules, right? That's having structure. But at the same time, like having too many rules, too many structures for our kids even, it can lead to, it can lead to like this lack of in, intuitiveness, if that's a word. Is that a, is that a word, intuitiveness? I'm making it a word if it's not one. But just kind of commonsensically thinking, children, humans, for all of time, we did have this intuition. We, is, that the, is that the word I'm looking for, intuition, intuitiveness? I don't know. We're going with it. But we've had this intuition for, you know, we had this set kind of structure of what was food. All we had was food from nature. Now we have expand that out, balloon that out like a thousand fold, even more, a million fold. Like we have so many more food products, usually most of which have never seen nature, have seen more of the inside of a lab than they have seen nature. So now we do need to have more structure now. The more and more we are, our environment lacks structure, the more and more we do need to create structure in our own home. Because if our environment, if our society is not creating the structure, the food structure, that's going to like leach over into our lives, which is going to make us live lives haphazardly. So we need to create that structure and learn how to say no in our homes, but we can't have too many rules and too much structure because that can also cause emotional eating because have you ever said no to something and like you can't have something, you can't have a relationship, you can't have that guy or girl you want, you can't have something in your life. So when you can't have something, the more you want that thing, the more you want that thing, the more you think about that thing. So everything's an option, but understanding is that option appropriate for you right now? And having that perspective and that ability to say no and having that perspective that saying no is not a disorder, is not restrictive, is not deprivation. Also, some more major causes of emotional eating. Dieting, a dieting mentality. Having this restricted access to food can contribute to emotional eating like I just talked about. Diets are essentially constant judgment about what and how much you're eating. Often when not on a diet, people will eat more than they did before the diet in an effort to compensate for what they missed out on while on the diet. You're not on a diet on this program. You're, you're not dieting with your nutrition on this program. You're not dieting your sleep. You're not dieting your movement. This is just a way of life for you. You're changing your lifestyle. You're changing to, to have better habits and you're changing the way you see the world. So that's all it is. Ditch that dieting mentality and change the way you see food and we're going to talk more about that to come in some future lessons, the way you see food. Also, unacceptable emotions. Everyone has emotions, but, with, but within certain households, emotions are seen as unacceptable. Individuals may learn to use food as a way to avoid or suppress emotions. Emotions can never be totally disregarded. They manifest themselves in some way or another, often in the form of emotional eating. Okay, Escape. This is another way to, uh, that causes emotional eating. Eating can be used as an escape from troubling thoughts or situations. Some lose their sense of self in the pleasurable aspects of eating. Going out to eat may remove someone from an abusive or difficult situation. Right? You might go out to eat. You might go somewhere else to another environment, um, escaping or avoiding it to you know, forget about your thoughts or your emotions. And like I said, place yourself in that different environment. But what we don't want to do is avoid our emotions. We don't want to push those things deep down inside of us. We don't want to disregard them at all. When emotions arise, they're there, they're telling us something. They're telling us, um, they're a sign that something is going on in our life and that we need to listen to it. That is probably the hardest thing you might ever have to do in life is being okay to listening to your emotions. That might be one of the hardest things you have to do. But it's listening to your emotions, not disregarding them, not trying to escape from them through um, doing something different, through emotional eating, through popping in Netflix. You know, when, uh, you know, Instagram recently went down, when, when uh, social media goes down, people can't do that. So then they freak out because you have to be alone with your thoughts. That's what people hate about meditation. Like, uh, so we go on Netflix or like when a commercial comes on, we instantly go to... Uh, you know, our phones and our devices and we scroll and, and try not to be alone with our thoughts. 
So it's like escaping our emotions and our thoughts is not the way we want to go about this. We want to be in control of our lives. Avoidance. Food can be used to avoid uncomfortable things such as emotion, other people, intimacy, and trust. I kind of just talked about that. PTSD, sexual abuse, food abuse, and invalidation. These are all causes of emotional eating. Okay, Loneliness is another cause of emotional eating. In your own life, take a step back, kind of evaluate all this, figure out what it is that's a major trigger for you, major causes for you. Is it trigger foods? trigger feelings, trigger environments, past traumas, um, loneliness, escape, avoidance, PTSD, abuse of any kind. I might have just named most of them. So now moving on to another few key points here. Before I jump into your seven tips for helping with emotional eating, how is emotional eating diagnosed? This can be challenging because secrecy, shame, and denial are often commonly seen. I might approach you and if you're not somebody that is very open to this, uh, I'm not saying you are, but I'm just saying it's, you know, you could be someone or there could be someone out there where they try and hide it. They're shameful of it. They, 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 they want to try and be secretive about it. They are in denial about it because maybe they've been impacted so much. This is very common for people because, like I said, guilt and shame. But like I mentioned at the beginning of this lesson, you don't have anything to be ashamed of. You were just born into the same environment that we were all born into. And when you compare yourself to others' highlight reels on social media, you know you're behind the scenes. They don't know you're behind the scenes. We all have behind the scenes, right? You might see all my wins on social media, but you don't see that past trauma that I just shared with you because I'm not highlighting that on social media. Not necessarily. Some people do, but... Um, when it's just flooded with highlight reels, we compare our behind the scenes to that. And so then we feel imperfect. We feel like everyone else is living perfect lives, but yet we are imperfect. And they don't see the struggles that we go through. They don't see the loneliness. They don't see the traumas. They don't see all these feelings that we feel. So understanding that you have nothing to be ashamed of. You have nothing to feel guilty about because we're all in the same environment and this is the environment that is really good at making people feel the way that you might be feeling so it's understanding that it is not your fault but if you do not own up to it and accept it and choose to move past it then it is your fault once you become aware you have two decisions you can fight or flee you can keep pushing forward, leave your comfort zone, address those thoughts, those feelings, those emotions, or you can flee right back into your comfort zone, sit on Netflix, just keep scrolling on social media, emotional eats, and not address all this stuff that we just talked about. That's why I'm your coach and I'm here to help you through all that. You're not alone in this. No matter how much you might feel it, there's no loneliness about this because I shared personal stories with you. We all go through these things. It's having people there with us that, that get us, that know us, that feel us, that are there to hold our hand and walk with us. It's understanding that it's hard to diagnose this. And I say diagnose loosely because it's not like I want you to have this label on you as like, hey, my name is Craig. I'm an emotional eater. Like I don't want you to have to go to like uh, AA or like Emotional Eating Anonymous. I don't want you to go to that length unless you truly do need something like that. That's totally fine. But like I want to be your person or you can have many other people in your life to talk to you about this. So understanding like it's okay to own up to this stuff. It truly is. And it'll be one of the most liberating things you ever do in your entire life. How do we go about treating it once we do own up to it? Conventional Medical professionals often prescribe two common antidepressants, Lovox and Zoloft. This is the problem with the current medical establishment is that we do, it doesn't address everything that I just talked about. It doesn't address the past traumas. It doesn't address all that mainly because they don't see that as like, like you can't profit off that. You can't 
it's it's seen as woo woo. Instead, just take this pill for feeling this way because you're a bad person and you just can't control yourself and you just emotional eat and you just can't control, you know? So it's like, take these pills, you'll feel better. But often these things come with many side effects. And the major problem with this is that just the idea, I talked about this already, but just the idea of taking these antidepressants that that these pharmaceuticals give you, the idea of prescribing you these medications, just subdue the negative emotions that underlie the urge to overeat. It's a, it's a synthetic way to help the encouragement of pushing those emotions further and further down. I just talked about how that is not the thing that we want to do. That is not the thing that we want to do. We want to let it out and release it. But taking these antidepressants, and I don't know your specific case, maybe, maybe they are beneficial in certain acute instances, but the amount that they're being prescribed in our world today, I think people need more and better outlets of letting out their emotions, not pushing them down even further because these medications don't help you undo the, the past traumas, don't help you undo the things that you're cry your body's crying out for, your emotional eating for some reason. And just taking drugs is not um, addressing any of that. So if you are somebody on an antidepressant, it's okay. Just acknowledge it and please do not stop taking your medication after hearing this. Work with your doctor. Work with your doctor. I've told this story. I'll tell it uh, soon to come, but I've been on antidepressants myself. And... It's not a cycle that I wanted to be on. This is over a decade ago. I did not want to be on these things. So I just stopped taking them. But I'm not telling you to just stop taking your medications. Work with your doctor still, but understand that that is just a band-aid for talk therapy. It's just a band-aid for addressing that root cause of these things. So what is the way to address these root causes of emotional eating? There are many psychotherapeutic approaches that mental health professionals have used to try to empower their clients to overcome this unhealthy lifestyle habit, such as behavioral therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectic behavioral therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, as well as mindful-based cognitive therapy. No matter the approach, no matter the approach that we use together, the essential goal is always to wean away from emotional eating, to get food, at, to stop using food as the coping mechanism, helping you to replace this unhealthy habit with positive thoughts and actions. That's the entire purpose of this lesson is to help you to see that you have purpose in your life and how to kind of remove that emotional eating and replace it with something of equal or greater value that's going to benefit your life. So with all that being said, I want to quickly jump into these seven tips for emotional eating. The very first one is, of course, as you might have already been able to guess, reduce stress. But just to give you some quick wins and takeaways inside this lesson, listen, stress is a natural part of life, but when it is not properly managed, it can contribute to weight gain, hormone imbalances, chronic inflammation, and a lot of other things, autoimmune conditions. Here's simple ways to reduce stress, as you probably already know. Deep breathing, meditation, mindfulness, decompress, laugh more, play more, listen to calming music, exercise, gratitude, and other self-care methods, massage, touching, or whatever, like, you know, like touching your partner, like, like you know, holding hands is what I mean. But like, you know, whatever touching you want to do, whatever, you know, floats your, whatever tickles your fancy, poor choices of words right now, poor choices of words. Um, reduce your stress in your life. However, you got to do it. That is going to be health promoting to you. The second tip to help with emotional eating, this is to move your body. We know that movement is such a great way to help with stress, with emotional eating. If you're faced with, uh, if you feel the urge to emotional eat, if you feel yourself gravitating towards the kitchen, instead gravitate towards the door, go on a walk. Call up your friend, call up me, call up someone, go on a walk. 
or do your workout or do some form of movement. I guarantee you within 10 minutes, you will not feel the need to overeat. Go on, go on a walk. A good starting point is to briskly walk about two times a week for about 20 minutes. After that, move up to three times a week for 30 minutes. A few weeks later, four times a week for 40 minutes. Finally, five times a week for 50 minutes. If you can get to that, if you can get to five times a week for 50 minutes, you're elite. Let's see if you can do that. I'm setting this challenge right here and now. Let me know in the comment section below how many times you're walking per week and for how long. Third tip that's going to help with emotional eating. Prioritize, please, please prioritize rest and recovery. In our society, it's very easy to feel like we are behind. It's very easy to feel like if we are not taking action, um, proactively taking action, like if we're not doing something, then we're just lazy. We need both. We need proactive and we need uh, the relaxation. We need all this stuff. We need a good night of sleep. We need to... We, we need to recharge ourselves. We need to recharge our mitochondria, our mind. We need to recharge all these things inside of our bodies. We just need to recharge ourselves. So focus on rest and recovery. Do not overdo your workouts. Uh, do all the things. Do all the things that are gonna help you to relax, okay? Self-care, practice that self-care. Number four is same thing here. Make time for play. Make time for play. Do the things you love, do a hobby, something that gets you into that flow state, all right? For me, it's, it's surfing. I love to, to hit the waves. I love to surf. I love to do a lot of other things too, but that for me is like the thing that you can't take technology out into the ocean. Uh, you're just alone with your thoughts out there and you're constantly trying to figure out how you can ride that, that wave in. You're in nature. You're in sunlight. It's, it's beautiful. Try and do something like that. Make time for play. Make time for you. And funny enough, the number fifth tip is to prioritize time for you. Prioritize time for you. Self-care is one of the things that many Busy people neglect altogether, right? Life is busy for all of us, but it's the first thing that we neglect because, you know, we put others first, but when we don't put ourselves first, we cannot show up as good as we want to other people. It can be easy to be there for other people, for family, work, the community, but what about yourself? When you give to the point of depletion, you do not have anything truly worthwhile to share with others. If you're pouring from an empty glass, what the heck are you even giving? What, what are you giving? Wouldn't it be better to fill your cup up and pour from the overflow? Pour from that overflow. Fill yourself up so much eating good foods, moving your body, sleeping, all the stuff. So that way you have more than enough to give to other people. So that way you have more than enough to give to other people. I'm giving you my overflow right now. Please accept it. Use it. Don't throw it away in the trash. Number six out of seven tips to help with emotional eating. Become vulnerable. Become vulnerable. This is powerful. Becoming vulnerable like I just did with you earlier in this lesson. We need to own our stories. Every single one of them our entire life story and all the stories in between. We need to own it because that's who we are. That's when you're looking at me and when I'm looking at you, we're seeing a sum product of the choices that we've made at this point in our lives. Become vulnerable. Because as Brene Brown once said, vulnerability is not weakness. It takes courage to be vulnerable. Owning your story is really freaking difficult. And I'm paraphrasing what she said because I don't think she said freaking. Owning your story is really freaking difficult. But it is not nearly as difficult as spending your entire life trying to run from it. Vulnerability is not weakness. It takes true strength to be courageous. It takes true strength to stand up for what you believe is right. Be vulnerable. Own your story. The seventh tip here. The seventh tip out of seven ways to help with emotional eating. You can take certain supplements. You can take food. You can take certain nutrients to help with this. Because often when we are not uh, nourished, 
you know, we're going to just feel the need to emotionally because we're stressed, because maybe we're not getting in the nutrients our bodies need. We're not able to handle that stress effectively or like we're more predisposed to stress. We're more predisposed to reacting. A lot, a lot happens in our biochemistry when we're not adequately nourished. And some of these 10 supplements here that you can take, vitamin C, vitamin C, whether that's from lemons or citrus fruits, bell peppers, uh, pressure cook the bell peppers, but citrus fruits is what I recommend. You can do superfoods like camu camu, uh, acerola cherry, or you can take vitamin C supplements. Ask me about what you can get in your supplement dispensary on full script. You can take a well-formulated multivitamin. Also talk to me about that on full script. Chromium, magnesium, magnesium when it comes to that, get the forms that end in A-T-E. Magnesium glycinate, malate, L-threonate, uh, get those forms of magnesium citrate, but avoid magnesium oxide. Your uh, toilet will thank me later. Omega threes, glutamine, five HTP, ginseng, dandelion, and several essential oils like rosemary and rose can be great for helping with like stress and just keeping you optimally the optimal built machine that you are. So this was your lesson on emotional eating. I hope you took a lot of uh, tips and takeaways from this. Please let me know your favorites in the comment section below. Mitochondria are the power plants of ourselves that take the food that we eat, the air we breathe, the oxygen that we breathe, and turn that into energy. And so if you are out there currently feeling pretty crappy, not energized, not feeling that well, how do we go about feeling good?